Hi, it's Robin. I've got here the March 1979 issue of Popular Science, along with articles about the bizarre world of holography, powered parafoil, every man's flying machine, how we'll build those giant space structures, auto troubleshooting, presumably about automobiles, the cover stories about home computers, how they compare, and they show a number of the home computers that were available in early 1979. I'm really very fascinated by this era of computing when everything was so different and expectations were changing constantly from the late 1970s into the early 1980s. Things start to settle down a bit once the IBM PC and Commodore 64, in particular, were introduced. Back in the days when there were ads for cigarettes in every issue, it was always about the taste. And Lotar. Lotar. And here in the table of contents, we're interested in memory, add-ons, check before you buy a home computer, how to find a system that's useful to you, a buyer's guide is included on page 102. So I'd like to look at this buyer's guide today. I had never even heard of some of the computers shown here. As we go through this, try to figure out which of these computers you would have bought back then just based on this information. Okay, page 102. <laughs> More smokes. Well, Panasonic ad for their headphones. GM's new front drive cars lead the way. Monster track layer. One tough tractor. Get into the booming field of solar technology. Oh, there's a space shuttle. Help him build a space structure. Gas stretching RVs. On the road for 79 turbo motor homes. Get 12 months of popular science for only $9.94. So here we are. Check before you buy a home computer. There's the TRS-80, what came to be known as the Model 1. Complete home computers such as this TRS-80 come with a keyboard, computer, TV monitor, and data saving system. Also known as a cassette. There's lots to choose from. Here's how to compute the features best for you by William J. Hawkins, photos by Orlando Guerra. Two years ago, I got my first home computer running, but only after weeks of kit building and learning the basics of programming, instructing the beast what to do and how to do it. I found that I had to be a combination programmer, engineer to make it do any useful work. A lot has changed since then. Now a home computer comes pre-built, pre-programmed, and ready to do extensive math and much more the moment you plug it in. You don't have to do complicated programming anymore. Just buy canned programs that instantly teach it to do income tax returns or balance your checkbook. And with just a few hours experience, you can write your own custom programs as well. Choosing a home computer, unfortunately, is not as easy as using one. To begin with, they come in a lot of different forms. The PET, for example, is an all-in-one unit with microprocessor, the brain of the system, a TV console for displaying the data, a keyboard for entering info, and a cassette recorder for saving programs for future use. The Radio Shack, on the other hand, comes with separate components sold as one package. Heath sells components individually. Others supply everything but the TV. You use your home TV. How do you decide which machine is best for you? You'll have to answer three basic questions. What kind of programming? How much memory? What will you want in the way of add-ons now and in the future? Here's what you'll need to know to begin making those decisions. The heart of a computer is its central processor, its brain. Although this processor may appear to do all kinds of fabulous feats, it is in actuality nothing more than a collection of on-off electronic switches. 
In making even the most complex calculations, the processor simply asks a lot of questions that can be answered, either yes or no. In the computer, they're represented by strings of ones and zeros. Here's some more of the photos included. Apple II is one of the most flexible systems. Software can be changed by commands from the keyboard. Hardware, such as a disk system or printer, can be added by installing optional printed circuit cards and sockets on main board. The Apple was one of the first ones to ship a decent disk system. So obviously I know about the TRS-80 and the Apple, but how about this one? The CompuColor monitor contains the computer and a disk system. One button operation enters the disk almost instantly. It's got the disk drive vertically there next to the monitor in the same case. This really is a pretty fascinating computer that I know very little about. Curious if any of you own one or have even ever used one. Video Brain software is on cartridges. Most are dedicated programs. APLS cartridge lets you write your own programs. <laughs> so a computer that shipped with APLS. So both of those computers I've heard of, but I don't think I've ever seen one in person. And here they are being compared along with the TRS-80 and Apple II in early 1979. The processor, of course, doesn't know how to translate a real-life problem, balancing your checkbook, for example, into the proper series of ones and zeros to come out with the right answer. It has to be instructed every step, and a programmer can build a complex sequence of such instructions, the program, and make the computer do almost anything. Professional computer programmers often work in machine or assembly language, they actually feed it strings of ones and zeros. They talk, in other words, in binary numbers, the computer's native tongue. It is the fastest, most efficient way for a computer to operate, but this requires an extensive programming background. I actually find it really unlikely that in 1979, many professional programmers would be programming in binary, certainly at least octal or hexadecimal, if not an, a proper assembly language with mnemonics like, like we're familiar with on the 6502, load A, and so on. To get around this in a home system, high-level languages are used. These let you program in English-like sentences. The phrase you type in is automatically translated into binary codes. The most common language is BASIC. You type in words such as run, print, stop, and the computer does it. BASIC, or any other high-level language, is, in reality, simply another program. This program tells the computer what to do when it sees the word run, for example. BASIC comes in lots of forms. Some are relatively simple. Others are more complex. Some computers offer more than just one BASIC. The less expensive model comes with a simple version. Larger ones can be added later at additional cost. Computer people say some are smarter than others. They can perform many more functions, do them better and faster, and in some cases more accurately. For example, if you divide 22 by 7 in the simplest version, you'll get just 3 with no places behind the decimal point. Do it in a somewhat larger version and you may get 3.14. An even bigger BASIC may compute it to, perhaps, six places, and an extended BASIC may give you ten or more, with the option of printing it out in scientific notation. So that's actually a decent example. Back then, there were tiny BASICs and integer BASICs, and yes, you very much would get 22 divided by 7 and just get 3. I don't think I've ever used a BASIC that would provide, say, two decimal places of accuracy, but certainly a varying number. And this is somewhere where the Microsoft BASIC include with the PET was actually very good for 1977. By 1982, in the Commodore 64, maybe not so good. But we're just talking about 1979 today. So some more captions. Processor Tech Sol, or is it Sol, may look simple, but it accepts a majority of add-ons. Not really sure what that means accepts a majority of add-ons, like most things you would want to add to a computer, this does accept, I guess so. Hey, here's my favorite. Commodore PET computer is all-in-one. Programs may be saved or entered from internal cassette tape player. 
Keyboard is split. Numbers and math signs are on the smaller pad. Connectors on the side and rear of the main circuit board are for connecting add-ons. Heath computer is sold as individual gear for complete flexibility. The brain of the system contains sockets for extra memory or add-on circuitry. The keyboard and display show the status of memory and the microprocessor. And there's that buyer's guide to home computers, so we'll take a look at that closer in a bit. Some more captions. Program library for Interact Computer is quite large. Basic cassette tape is also available. Plug-in joysticks allow variable human input to program. So that's one I don't think I've ever heard of either. Here, keyboard overlay and basic cartridge converts a Bally game into a computer. I actually have one of those and I have the basic cartridge for it, but I mean to make a video about it. I actually, I'm not even sure if it works, but I find that pretty fascinating. Uh, here's a beautiful machine. Basic cartridge sets up the Exidy Sorcerer instantly. Conventional keyboard aids touch typing. Smaller numeric pad allows quick entry of numbers. So I've actually got one of those. So I'll show some B-roll of that. I think that's a fantastic computer. Really cool how the keyboard, computer, cartridge slot, all in one. They really did a lot of things right with that computer. It's too bad it didn't do better. Another one I don't really know. RCA VIP is a small instructional computer. Sockets accept add-on circuits. Looks a lot like a Kim or some of those other single board computers that just have like a hex pad. Another one I don't know, the APF PCOS. <laughs> APF PCOS 1 has two tape systems built in. These allow easy copying or editing of data from one drive to another. That's quite the thing. <laughs> what, a, what a machine, and then just a tiny loose modder popped on top there. I have heard of this one. Ohio Scientific's Challenger comes packaged as shown, or in parts, main board power supply, so you may build up slowly. Continuing on with things to consider. Also, small basics usually have a limited number of instant commands for you to use. They can do relatively simple things such as add, multiply, and square numbers on command. Large versions of BASIC have most of the complex commands needed for easily running a program, such as instant trig or square root functions. The largest versions usually add more convenience commands, such as renumbering your entire program to make it neat. Extended disk versions also include commands for controlling a high-speed disk recorder player. Despite the popularity of BASIC, two new machines don't use it. Video Brain uses an APLS language, and the APF uses PCOS. APLS is a shorthand way of programming. You use letters instead of words. It's a bit harder to memorize, but quicker once you master it. Hmm. I've never programmed an APLS before. PCOS goes to the other extreme. Simple but complete. Sentences are used for each instruction, such as display 2 plus 2. It's easy, but more on page 188, but more time-consuming to enter instructions. If you intend to do all your own programming, it really doesn't matter which language you select. However, if you wish to take advantage of pre-written, canned software, you may be at the mercy of the manufacturer for programs, so check to see what's available for a particular unit before you buy. UmTech and Exidy, <laughs> is that really UmTech? UmTech? UmTech and Exidy, who makes the Sorcerer, they actually made uh, video games first, for example, support their machines with packaged cartridges. Stick one in the computer and it instantly teaches the machine to play chess or manage the family budget. Most other manufacturers supply programs on cassette tape or high-speed discs, insert them, and the computer is programmed. Also, many programs, usually basic, are available in printed format. Books, flyers, and prepackaged booklets from software companies. Interesting that magazines aren't mentioned there. I think there were a fair number by 1979. I guess they don't want to recommend uh, reading magazines other than popular science. In these cases, you type them in by hand using the keyboard of the machine. 
Memory is fundamental in a computer. Before the machine can manipulate numbers or other information, those numbers must be in its memory. Also, it must have memory to store the programs that tell it how to do what you want. The more memory you have, the more your computer will do. Uh, interesting. But the more you have, the more it costs. You want enough to do the job, but you don't want to have a lot of expensive memory sitting around doing nothing. So how much do you need? So some things have never changed, eh? From time to time, I would hear of people putting way too much memory in their computer for the era. What's too much now? 128 gigabytes? Start by considering the memory needs of the BASIC or other high-level program you'll be using. BASIC, remember, is a program and needs storage. If you start with one of the extremely simple BASICs, strange apostrophe, it will need perhaps only 1K of memory. K stands for the prefix kilo, which means 1,000. <laughs> Pretty funny, back in 1979, you had to explain what kilo was, and they don't get into the 1,024. Thus, a 1K basic contains approximately 1,000 pieces of digital information, bytes, and requires that much memory space. A 1K basic is relatively simple and referred to as a tiny basic. Go one step up and you get a 4K basic. An 8K basic is probably about average. That's what was in the Commodore PET in 1979. And there are 12K and higher extended basics. In figuring memory needs, start with the amount required to hold the basic or other high-level language program. Once you've got that information stored, you need more memory to hold the information you want the computer to work on your program. Determining memory size. From my experience, I find the minimum should equal the length of the basic you're using. An 8K basic system, for instance, should have at least 8,000 bytes of memory left over for you to use, so you'd want 16K overall. To determine the size of a system's memory available to you, however, you'll have to compute it, if you'll pardon the expression, from its spec sheet, see table. You won't normally find a category marked user memory, Instead, memory is broken down by type. RAM, random access memory, and ROM, read-only memory, also called PROM or EPROM. RAM is a general type of memory. Data can be stored in it, changed if necessary, and read out again. A machine that comes with 16K of RAM, with 8K of it used to hold an 8K basic, for example, would have 8K left over for your programs. RAM memory is the backbone of the computer system, but it does have a drawback. Turn off the power and it forgets everything. All data are lost. You must re-enter BASIC every time you plug it in with a cassette, disc, or cartridge. For that reason, most home computers have BASIC stored in ROM memories with RAMs used only for your programs and data. The information originally put in them at the factory can't be changed or lost even with the power removed. The result the computer knows BASIC, allowing you to start programming immediately. So yeah, it's hard to think of a home computer not having BASIC and ROM, but that was true of some machines back then. And of course, it's true of all new machines as well. A system with BASIC and ROM, therefore, doesn't require as much RAM memory. A computer with 16K of RAM holding 8K BASIC would be comparable to another with 8K of RAM and 8K BASIC permanently stored in ROM. Besides BASIC, some systems, such as Apple, have other programs stored in ROM. These can be monitor programs, which allow you to communicate directly with the memory or microprocessor, debuggers, which help you find trouble in the equipment or software, or the ROM may even contain another language. Since the amount of memory can vary widely depending on how you use it, Many makers sell optional memory add-on packages. Heath, for example, sells plug-in boards. Each adds another 4 or 8K, depending on the board you buy, to the machine. If you suspect your programming requirements will grow along with the memory needed to support them, be sure extra memory can easily be added to the machine you choose. Add-ons. There's more to a computer than having it compute. Often additional features are needed to make it do the work you want it to do. Special features are sometimes built in. The CompuColor, for example, has graphics capability. You can program the computer to draw pictures or graphs on the TV screen. The Apple has a built-in speaker. Your programs can generate sound effects or music as well. 
Many features are really just sockets, called ports, built into the computer. These give it the ability to control outside devices, such as printers for making permanent records, or modems for sending and receiving data over the phone line to send programs to a friend, or even get stock values directly from Dow Jones. You may not need or want attachments now, but if the system is equipped for them, they can be easily added later. A bit of general advice. Before you buy any computer, try it. If you're a touch typist, some of the keyboards will be difficult for you to use. Small keys, non-standard keyboard. Have a salesman go through the loading, running, and saving of a program to verify the system is working normally. Buying a home computer is relatively simple. When you consider the challenge you'll have once you get it home, it is probably the only item you'll buy, especially at hundreds of dollars, that doesn't have a purpose. Exactly what it does and how it does it will be totally up to you. And there's the manufacturer's list. Apple Computers, Bally Manufacturing, Commodore, CompuColor Corp, Exidy, Heath, Interact Electronics, Ohio Scientific, Processor Technology, RCA VIP Marketing, Radio Shack, Um Tech. <laughs> Okay, let's get back to that buyer's guide. Okay, and here's the PS Buyer's Guide to Home Computers. This really is tiny print, PS being popular science. So here we have the different brands and models. The APF Picos 1, the Apple II, the Bally Comp Sys computer system, the Commodore Pet 1, 2, and 3. I don't remember them being called that in the marketing of the time, but maybe they were. CompuColor, 2, 3, 4, and 5. The Exidy Sorcerer, the Heath WH8, the Interact 1.8 and 1.16, the Ohio Scientific Challenger, Processor Tech Soul 1A, 2A, and 3A, the TRS 1 slash 4, 1 slash 16, 2 slash 4, and 2 slash 16, the RCA VIP, and the UMTEC. So the cheapest machine is like the RCA VIP at 249 but that was just barely a computer. <laughs> like, didn't have a full keyboard, a hex pad, I think, with the Chip 8 language. Hmm. 32 by 128 resolution, that's strange. It has tape jacks built in. Oh yeah, the RCA VIP has that 1802 processor. I've never tried to program that. Next cheapest is the Bally. It's really a game system. $300 with a Z80, 4K of RAM and 16K of ROM, and a 4K BASIC. Then there's the Ohio Scientific Challenger for $349. It's also 6502 with just 4K of RAM and 8K of ROM, 256 by 256 resolution. That's interesting. Could it do bitmaps? I don't know. There's also the Interact 1.8 for $500. And it came with 8K of RAM and a 2K basic ROM. What a bizarre resolution, 112 by 77. And for an extra $100, you got up to 16K of RAM, which was actually pretty cheap back then for an 8K RAM upgrade. And then the next cheapest machine is the Bottom End Radio Shack TRS-1. They're all Z80 based, 4K of RAM and 4K of ROM. They all say 128 by 48 resolution tape drive. And that tape drive was included, not built in, but they included in the package. And it's interesting that Radio Shack kept that $599 price for the base. And then, of course, went up 16K of RAM would be 889 in total. And there's also this TRS2 that had disk available. Another low one was that UMTEC VB400 with an E8 processor. Never heard of that. 2K of RAM and 17K of ROM for the APLS programming language. 200 by 400 resolution. It seems sometimes they put the height first and then the width, and sometimes it's switched around here. Most of the time you'd expect the larger number to actually be the horizontal resolution. So that's really strange, that APLS. And the next machine is the Heath WH8. 
Chan 8080 processor, 8K of RAM, and 1K of ROM. But I think it was a really bare bones machine. And then you had to buy basically everything extra. Okay, and next is the Commodore range. The PET 1, 2, and 3 starting at $795. Of course, it's a 6502 with 8K of RAM and 14K ROM. That's the kernel and basic. Oh, a 6K basic system. Interesting. And the black and white monitors included and built in. 40 by 25 resolution. That's in characters. And of course, you could do a pseudo bitmap. That'd be 80 by 50. Now, at price of $795, they initially announced the PET at $595, but that was for a 4K model. But they almost didn't ship that at all. But that was enough to get some of these other competitors, especially Radio Shack, to come in with a sub $600 model with just the 4K of RAM. I've heard conflicting reports about whether a 4K PET actually shipped or not. But that's where that $600 price point came from. It was Commodore's initial marketing. And then come the Exidy machines. Cheapest model is $895. They're all Z80 based with 8K RAM. They could go up to 16 or 32K RAM for about $250 for each extra level. 8K basic. Yeah, and the resolution 512 wide by 240. Very high resolution for the time. And then this fascinating CompuColor base model $995, 8080 processor. 8K of RAM and 16K of ROM. So that would be quite an advanced basic. And it's that color monitor included and the more expensive models that rapidly go up an extra five or even a thousand dollars have the higher resolution monitor. But it seems that the disk drive was included even in that cheapest model. That seems amazing to me. I've heard there were reliability problems with that machine. So it really seems like it should have been an absolutely killer machine. So they must have had problems with it. And now going on to the Apple machines, base machine of 1195 for 6502, but that does include 16K of RAM. So compared to the PET with 16K, 995, it's only $200 more for the Apple, but the PET had the built-in monitor and the built-in tape deck, 6K basic, but of course the Apple also had the advantage of producing a color display while the pet was only black and white. And it says 280 by 192 resolution. And you could go all the way up to 48K Apple II for 1795. Again, this is the original Apple II in 1979. And what's left? There's this APF PCOS one, which oh, it was 6502 based, 16K of RAM and 24K of ROM. Some of these machines really invested heavily with the odd languages. The PCOS with 24K ROM built in, and that strange UMTEC with 17K of ROM built in for its APLS language. And this is that PCOS language, whatever that is. Again, have any of you ever tried that? Black and white video source, 40 by 16. They have built in dual tapes. Okay, and finally, the most expensive machine of all are these Processor Tech Soul 1A for $24.95 base price for the 8080 processor, 16K of RAM and only 2K of ROM. The language is a 12K basic, so you would have to load basic from cassette, and it would use up 12 of your 16K in the base model for your $2,500 computer. 64 by 16 <laughs> text display tape. Wow. That soul is very expensive. You go up to 32K for an extra $300. The Soul 3A, $64.95 with 60, 60K of RAM. Just huge back then. Still only 2K of ROM. I guess a dual disc was included. So those are all the home computers that Popular Science covered in their buyer's guide back in early 1979. This was before the Atari computers came along. That was late 1979 and before the VIC-20 and so many other computers. And of course, this was just U.S. based. I actually don't know much about the U.K. computer scene in early 1979. Were there a lot of homegrown options there? I know there certainly were in the 80s. So out of all this, which ones would you have bought? I like the pet, but that CompuColor sure is fascinating. Of course, the Apple was a pretty good machine, uh, but you spent more for it. 
I do like the Exidy quite a bit. And I'm pretty fascinated that they uh, squeezed that game console in there because it had a basic cartridge available for it. It's funny, the Atari 2600 had a basic cartridge available too, but it was really terrible. I think this was a bit more legit with an actual tape saving system. All right, so let me know your thoughts. Thanks to my patrons for their support. All right, thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you next time. Scrap.